Welcome to Seth Marketing Academy. This lecture is on the economics of the digital age. As we know, there is a significant amount of academic research and practitioner viewpoint about the digital age and how transformative it is on society. We have lots of understanding and knowledge about the technological evolution. What we don't have is a fundamental disruptive economics of this industry. The plan around here in this lecture is to talk about how the economics of digital age are so radically different from the industrial age, which were as disruptive when we shifted from the agricultural age, for example, maybe 150 years ago. That's the focus. And I will start out by looking at two examples. The first example has to do with IBM. I'm sure most of you know that since the invention of the computing or computers, IBM was a vertically integrated organization. And the two real competencies, the two raw material ingredients of the industry obviously were software and semiconductors. IBM was the largest semiconductor company forever, also was the largest software producer, especially the machine language as it is called, like the assembler, inventor of Fortran language, which is the basic language, as well as in fact basic itself, which is a higher order language. It was the most innovative company ever but in the last 20, 25 years, IBM lost its leadership in semiconductors and its leadership in software. Surprisingly, the largest semiconductor company out of nowhere is Intel. And Intel was at one time struggling just to supply lower end chips for the game player makers such as Atari, Intellivision, before Japanese took over that industry. Similarly, with the PC revolution, Microsoft became the largest software producer in the world, and IBM lost both. Why? Because IBM was organized in the industrial age where what was most important was vertical integration. You invented things, you designed them, you made them, you sold them or consumed them in the company, and you serviced them. What was the most logical thing to do in industrial age, which is vertical integration, actually, as I will show you later on, in the digital age becomes a liability. There's a similar example I can also give you in the cell phone industry. As we all know, Motorola is the pioneer of the handheld cell phone industry. As you know, cell phone industry did not begin with portable handheld devices, but came as something that will be installed in the automobiles. And Motorola was the first one to put FM radio stations in the automobiles, hence the word Motorola. When they invented the cellular telephone industry, along with Bell Labs, which actually is the inventor of the cellular network architecture. But Motorola lost its leadership completely to Nokia, surprisingly, who is now struggling to compete against the Asian manufacturers such as HTC or ZTE. Of course, Samsung is knocking the doors of Nokia. Why Motorola lost the battle? Again, in the industrial age, it made a lot of sense to allow free market to establish a de facto standard. You fight for standards, different companies, you come out with different standards. Whereas in the digital age, it is very important to create a single standard up front, whether it's by de facto or by, in fact, law as Europeans did with GSM, and Nokia benefited from that. While Motorola allowed three, four standards, 
you had the old uh, analog standard called amps, then you had a TDMA, IDEN it's their own proprietary standard, and of course we never really dabbled into CDMA which was created more by Qualcomm, another company, and while the market process was sorting out, unfortunately time was lost. In fact this lecture primarily will talk about how it's not just the volume as it is in the industrial age, but volume on steroids or volume with speed is very key. And that's clearly what we are going to talk about in this lecture. Let me give you the opposite examples. The next example is why did DirecTV succeed? Here is a basically a highly industrial company called Hughes Corporation. Also a lot of military work they did. Suddenly finds this small VSAT technology useful for wireless cable as we call it. In other words getting your uh, video content, television content not through coaxial cable but actually through the air. Very smartly they decided that in the consumer markets it is better to license somebody else to manufacture as opposed to vertically integrating and therefore going into manufacturing yourself and then distributing to all the super retailers in consumer electronics and they were very smart to say we are primarily a technology company and a services company and we will have manufacturing done by others through licensing such as Thomson Electronics in France, such as Panasonic brand Masushita Corporation in Japan and the rest is the history. In fact, DirecTV became a very successful alternative to all the cable companies. Then finally, how did Texas Instrument transform itself completely? It's a great story and I was privileged to participate in that one actually lead the thought process. Texas Instruments survived by divesting consciously all of its manufacturing. You might remember Texas Instruments used to be a pioneer in making uh, calculators, especially for engineering calculators. It also had a PC business at one time. They were in the printer business. They made manufacturing of lots of products although their competency was much more into semiconductors and into technology. My review of their balance sheet showed that $600 million of R&D annually was generating $1.4 billion of royalty income annually forever and there was not a single manufacturing plant that can deliver that much return on its assets. And of course manufacturing requires all of the regulatory issues, environmental issues, employee issues, etc. So you can be a small technology company with a handful of highly, highly scientific people, TI fellows as they are called, use their brain power, invent technologies, but again you don't have to manufacture yourself. And TI has survived very well in the process and they have divested all of their manufacturing and become primarily a technology company and that's a transition that has been very helpful to them. That's because they finally understood from the industrial age where the focus is on manufacturing to the digital age. And one of the great great companies, I've done a lot of research on this company because I like the company called Tektronix. Every engineer all over the world knew what was known as the blue box. They were the test and measurement company so anything in the laboratory you were doing something if you wanted a testing and a measurement instrument it was made by Tektronix which had a 65 percent market share worldwide nobody can come close to them. But their scientists believed that the world will be analog. In fact they thought digital technology will be inferior which is technically true. As we have seen with 35mm films in movie productions 
as we have seen in xerography, for example, digital technology as it was evolving was like first generation software, still has a lot of in fact quirks and a lot of trial and error issues. It may not be ready for prime time even. So if you are trained in the analog technologies, as scientists and engineers in a company, and if you are a technology driven company and a manufacturing oriented because of the industrial age, you will always look down upon a new technology coming in. And so analog culture actually destroyed the company in the process. And by the way, I've seen the same thing with Lucent in their old business, which we used to call primarily a PBX business and Dimension PBX was created. You had an analog PBX and this was true of all the telco manufacturer companies such as for example Western Electric which is now Lucent or such as Alcatel for example NEC and it became digital by totally an outside company called Rome and Rome, in the Rome company actually transformed the whole PBX market. That's very interesting again that analog culture which is great for the industrial age but not good in fact for the digital age. So what's the fundamental shift from the industrial to the digital age? The fundamental shift is the world is going from analog to digital everywhere. In fact, it's so universal and digital is not just computer aspect, but all forms of communication, all forms of information, etc., which I will show you in this second presentation. But the second major dimensional shift from the industrial to the digital age is that in industrial markets you generally begin primarily with the large industrial customers, business customers, manufacturers, or you deal with the government and consumer markets are always hands me down. Consumer markets is not where scientists work and put their mind because to them it is like inventing Mickey Mouse. At all universities in the R&D departments that I have worked with and as I worked with corporate laboratories like GM Tech Center in Warren, Michigan or Bell Labs for example, which is a world class enterprise, you find that the scientists are trained primarily in the industrial age to think about business markets, think about government markets, think about military markets and not the consumer markets. And as I will show you, the economics of digital age are primarily mass market oriented. And the mass markets you find are in consumer markets. And therefore, how do you start with the consumer markets first? And then you go to the industrial markets is a absolutely radical thought from the industrial age to the digital age. And that's going to be transforming the industries and smarter companies will learn how to start with consumer markets and then go up to the industrial markets as Japanese have done both for LCD technology which you might remember came on things like watches for example or on calculators. Today LCD technology is equally important in a military fighter plane such as F-16 or maybe even F-22 incredible shifts and these are the two areas where companies either will succeed or they will fail as things become all digital. What forces are driving this shift? And I already given some hint but I will repeat some of the things. The first major force is digital technology actually is a convergent technology. The barriers created between voice, data and video, three forms of communication, is going away in the digital world. Digital world blurs that boundary. In other words, what analog technology kept them separate is not the case. So convergence is one key driver. Second major driver is what's known as Moore's law, which means speed matters and I'll come to that in a moment in some detail. Third one is emergence of large emerging economies where consumer markets are into billions, not into millions anymore, such as China and India. And the last area is that we do see rise of new multinationals and they're coming from all over the world and not just from 
one geography such as the Silicon Valley or the industrial um, might of the United States. So let's go into each one of them in some depth. We have seen the convergence in devices. So you have the cameras and the cell phones together now. Smartphones are already here, the Blackberry which began the trend in some fashion, taken over by iPhone, maybe Samsung will come about something better even. Kindle is another major convergent device that we have seen and Amazon started a thing. Of course, we also have uh, devices made by other companies like Barnes and Nobles, for example, has its own device uh, called Nook. And we have seen video game players where you have a huge convergence between image, voice, and a lot of data at the same time, such as the Wii, Nintendo, PlayStation, Xbox, all those devices. Similar convergence we have seen between voice, video, and data is in the infrastructure behind the scenes, such as at the server level, for example, or at the switch level. So switches and servers which are involved in communication and information industry are all digital now. As I mentioned about the PBX, now what you have is not a regular switch, but what is called a soft switch, where software creates more and more upgrades much faster, can be done every four months, six months, both into operating uh, systems, for example, OSS, or into what is called the billing and uh, services system, BSS, for example, which is business uh, propositions by and large on the business side. It's incredible to see how fast it has moved. Broadband, wireless cable, and telco are all digital technologies now. Similarly, the last area where the digital age is having huge impact and a transformative nature is on all the applications. Today I can get information and I can order what I want instantly because there is a complete convergence of the data into data, video pictures, any catalog today I have it, all I have to do is a Google search for example or go to each retailer's website and Amazon of course has led the way. So you see the same thing, online e-commerce in business to business market. Companies like Cisco Systems are claiming that 75% of all their incoming orders are now strictly online now, no more paperwork, which used to be a lot of time and everything. It was delay and errors. And we have seen, of course, the rise of social media to a level that was unimaginable such as the Facebook with 900 million subscribers, even this time may cross billion by the time this lecture is over even probably, which is interesting that you could never get in industrial markets. It's all consumer markets. So is in fact Google. So is in fact Hotmail that was a pioneer. So we'll talk about all this in some details. And the last one is that we have seen so many consumer apps. It's incredible to see for everything I want to do, find a restaurant, find a gas station, I have an app. So apps is everywhere and apps journey has just begun. So all this shows you convergence is a major, major activity. Second factor driving is what's known as Moore's law. Jeffrey Moore is one of the founders of Intel and he discovered in the semiconductor industry that unless you double the performance of the chip and the integrated circuit in 18 months, you can survive in the industry. And that led to what is known as Moore's Law, doubling the performance every 18 months. And you therefore saw Intel moving very aggressively from 286 to 386 to 486 chip, switch to Pentium, now that into another architecture altogether, that speed is unthinkable in the industrial age. In fact, the speed in semiconductors and software is, or everything internet in general, is much greater than even the fashion industry. And we thought fashion industry was primarily the one that always had a quick cycle, because fashion comes and goes and dies out, but the technology industry here, especially the semiconductors and software, the underlying sort of the components or the, or the raw materials of this industry 
are absolutely moving at a mind-boggling speed. And if you believe that Moore's law every 18 months is quite fast, well, there is an internet law. Internet law says that things will change every four to six months even. So this kind of a speed was unimaginable. In industrial age, we talked about primarily the volume, but not volume with speed, which is the main emphasis of this lecture. What it says is that rather than the typical approach to diffusion of an innovation, which takes a long, slow cycle to start and then take off and then taper off, and you have the innovators and the early adopters and the early majority and the late majority is very slow. What you have to do is to go with an exponential model which means you get off the ground very fast, very rapidly, and reach the 100% saturation as fast as you can. And that means rather than diffusion of innovation, you must democratize innovation. And the largest democracy is in the consumer markets, not in the business markets. And even in the business markets, we have seen, most of us have only talked about large corporations as our customers, not small and medium enterprises, which is like 95, 98% of all licensed businesses, but they're too small, they can't afford our technology, etc., etc., all kinds of arguments. So we have been always dealing in business to business market with very handful of customers. And especially we're dealing with the government and of course the military, the DOD, for example, it is even more handful. Uh, the last comment which is related is the product life cycle. In the case of the digital age, unlike industrial age, you must have product replacement cycle, which means how fast can you replace the existing product? It is often referred to as the migration strategy. IBM started that in the mainframe computing age with, for example, early machines were called 650, 7070, 7090 was the second series. Then 360, 370 was a very successful series. Then 3300 platforms, and they would upgrade a typical hardware, which is a multi-million dollar investment, maybe over five to seven year cycle, when the life would be 20, 15 years. That was true for the switches, when they were electromechanical, in the case of telephone companies. Very slow product replacement cycle, because the costs were very high and you had not enough depreciation on the books to justify to discard the products. They are working very well, but today have you seen cell phones? Cell phones are changing every three months, four months. And people either give it to somebody else, create a used market, as IBM did in the mainframe computers by taking the old install base, which is working fine, and giving to some other customers through a third party uh, distributor actually. But the cycles are much faster, which is the key point I want to make. The cycles are massive. So it is not really in the human life we have to calculate. This is like dog years. Dog years are seven times faster than the human life. So it is that kind of a calculation. And this also says very importantly a key message for companies like HP, for example, or Xerox at one time, or Kodak in the consumer markets, what was known as a razor and a blade principle, where you give away the razor at affordable prices, maybe even as loss leaders, but then you made money on the blades the old Gillette principle, the old Kodak principle, that razor and blade thinking goes out of the window here. Because the cartridges that you make money just don't have enough life, because the machine becomes obsolete. And think about how much change has taken place only in the last 15, 20 years in the printers. My memory of printers were large scale printers made by Texas Instruments and others. Storage devices were the same way, you know, there were very large scale Ampex used to make storage devices, very expensive, very bulky, will fill a whole room actually. Just for computers, today you see very, very small devices with more capabilities. 
And the printer life is just like PC life, very rapid a cycle change. So what has happened in the PC industry, what is happening in the printer industry says that you don't have the opportunity to install the equipment and then you make money for a long period of time by selling the uh, cartridges or supplies, whatever supplies are. Could be a paper as a supply, for example, software as a supply because it changes so dramatically. So these are the four main drivers as fundamental disruptors from the industrial to the digital age. I wanted to mention growth of emerging markets. I have a book called Chindia Rising where I have actually articulated that these two nations with billion plus population each are now aspiring to become from agriculture to the industrial age. Families want to be middle class families, want to be modern families, which means they want appliances, they want automobiles, they want cell phones, they want PCs, they want consumer electronics, and the demand is so overwhelming that it is going to change the paradigm from the industrial to the consumer markets. And we have seen this, as I mentioned, in the cell phones, the broadband, the largest number of internet user subscribers are now in China not in America. Same thing, largest number of cell phone subscribers are in China and second largest India and not in America or in Europe or in Japan for that matter because they have the advantage of the large population market that is about to buy modern technologies. We have seen the same thing, large consumer markets as I mentioned in social media and of course now in automobiles and appliances. Again, China is now almost number one in automobile buying every year, not America. China is also number one in appliances. They have their own company called Hire, just goes on and on. So the large consumer markets is a very key event that is transforming, especially the rise of the emerging economies, transforming from the industrial to the digital age. In fact, I have forecasted that we talked about with such passion about the Silicon Valley today, but in less than 10 years, we'll be talking with the same excitement about what I call the Shanghai Valley. Shanghai Valley is where the Taiwanese have already shifted a lot of their semiconductor capacity into mainland China. They are also having all the components made, including for companies in Silicon Valley, such as Apple, and they are also, in fact, now gunning for a lot of software. And by the way, that is true about out of nowhere in less than three decades, you see Bangalore in India becoming the software capital of the world. All of the Silicon Valley companies have large presence in India, whether it's a Microsoft or Intel or IBM and even now Oracle just goes on and on and they have their own development centers because these two nations, China and India, also have a very large, educated, talented population, especially in engineering and in sciences. Also, we see significant growth in the infrastructure investment and into the defense industries in both of these countries, as it will be true for other emerging markets. So that's the third major factor, the growth of emerging economies. And the fourth factor has to do with the rise of what I call digital multinationals. So Indian software multinationals are companies like Infosys, Wipro, TCS, which is Tata Consultancy Services. All of them already crossed $6 billion. In a couple of years, they are aspiring to become at least $10 billion company each. The total Indian software industry is now estimated to be about 80 billion and closely becoming a hundred billion dollar industry, not just by the Indian multinationals, but by everybody. And TCS is about to cross 10 billion dollars out of nowhere. Remember, these companies began strictly to do the work for Y2K issues under the legacy computers. But today they have become quite sophisticated. They do enterprise uh, installations for SAP installation, Oracle installation, anybody's installation. They can do almost system integration if a company wants that. 
So this large new multinationals from India in software, we need to watch because they may impact the digital age because they don't have the legacy of the industrial age. Similarly, we have seen Chinese multinationals in the digital age like Huawei Technologies. Very new, does not have the legacy of the industrial age and therefore they will think differently upfront. China Mobile is the largest cellular network operator. It is as big or bigger than Vodafone. Maybe in revenue Vodafone may be more, but in number of subscribers it is actually China Mobile. And the third largest mobile company is from India called Airtel. China also has consumer electronics company called ZTE as I mentioned and HTC and they're all gunning to come into the consumer electronics and into the digital products and technologies. And they will start with consumer markets and will go up to the industrial is my forecast primarily. We also see the rise of new Silicon Valley multinationals. And these are companies we never heard of maybe 20 years ago, such as Google. Electronic Arts that makes all of the video games, for example. Animation studios like DreamWorks and Pixar. They're all newer companies. They don't have the legacy of the industrial age. And therefore, companies that have an industrial age, a legacy and a culture actually are at a disadvantage. And of course, the latest one everybody talks about is Facebook along with LinkedIn and all of the social media companies as we call them. Not just Silicon Valleys, not just Asia, but you see the rest of the world multinationals also here and they are companies like SAP in software, companies like Samsung which has become absolutely remarkable transformation, innovation leader now and gunning for the digital age markets primarily and of course OnStar which is a very strategic technology play by General Motors. They've spun that one out as a standalone subsidiary. Every automobile now I can have as a mobile communication platform. Later on I will talk about that one how every automobile can be my base station mobile so I don't have to build these towers for mobile broadband which is where the world is going. So that's very key to understand that these four drivers of change are transforming from the industrial to the digital age and in the next slide I will just show you that if you look upon the x-axis is what I call scale the volume y-axis is the speed, the vertical axis, you see at the bottom agricultural age, then we are transforming into the industrial age and now we're going into the digital age. At each time I plotted linearly but actually there's a discontinuity, uh, each one has created an enormous discontinuity primarily from a scale viewpoint in agriculture to industrial level but in the case of industrial to digital it is much more the speed. So what we will do is to look upon the economics of the three ages. So we compare the economics of the agriculture age with the industrial age with the digital age and that's where the transformation is remarkable as I will show you. So let's look at the economics of the agriculture age. In the agriculture age the total cost is equal to only variable cost. Fixed cost is land but land is inherited and therefore it is not even calculated. So when you only have variable cost then mathematics tells us that the only thing you can maximize is resources that you have. You cannot maximize profits. So you just have to accumulate more resources and what are the key resources in the agriculture age? Land and serfs who work for you in servitude as it has been the case in the old days. As we have it still in many parts of uh, Latin America where you have large plantations and people actually are bonded workers. As we have it in Africa as we have it in Asia, especially in countries like India, 
which is a very agriculturally fertile land. So given that situation, what one can maximize are resources, and that's the only thing you can do, and more you have the resources with you, and more you pass on that resources to the next generation, the wealthier you are. That's how you make money. And that has been the case with uh, nobles, emperors, kings who own large tracts of land and had more people who were under their jurisdiction by and large. So resource advantage is the key one and you maximize your resources. This paradigm shifts in the industrial age dramatically. And it is as transformative on the agriculture age that then we have imagined. Since labor was a shortage as a resource, in industrial age we invented the concept that the total cost is both variable cost and a fixed cost. By the way, fixed cost can go as much as 40-50% in industrial age, such as in the aerospace industry, maybe in the automobile industry, where you have a very large-scale automated assembly principle. And the cost of the material as a percent of the total cost is not 100%. We understood now the economics of maximizing profits because we created the theory of marginal cost. And mathematics tells us that the marginal price, which is the price for the next unit that you produce, must equal your marginal cost, which is the cost of making that incremental next unit. So now you are able to maximize your profits when your marginal price equals your marginal cost. In order to come down fast toward reducing your marginal cost, you have to recover your fixed cost as quickly as possible. So you have a fixed cost recovery as your key strategy and therefore the fastest way to recover your fixed cost is to increase the scale. I mean this is the brain child of Henry Ford when he created Model T. People used to make cars one at a time in the old days, almost like pre-industrial age. You made jewelry one at a time. You made every product one at a time, as we still do, surprisingly, in building homes, which are built one at a time as opposed to prefabricated assembled homes that you just bring in and put it together on a piece of land or on a lot. Henry Ford was brilliant. He saw the economics of producing affordable automobiles. Model T was the biggest success. He could make Model T as $400 per unit cost when the typical, the horseless buggies as they were called, which are the automobiles produced before that one will be made one at a time. And the cost would be maybe thousands of dollars. Key change. He got this supply advantage by having every supplier invest their capital into the business. Smart idea. And he ramped it up and the more you simplified the product, offer just one color. People used to ask him, why only offer Model T in black color? Because people want to show off their automobiles. It's a conspicuous consumption item. And his answer was that customers can have all the choice of color so long as it is black. Do you think he was dumb? Absolutely not. He was a very brilliant, understood because his game plan was to make affordable automobile. And if we change just one more color, let's say white, then all the components have to change. And actually DuPont as a supplier of chemicals was not able to even produce anti-corrosive chemicals. The level of steel refining was not that good, more like iron as opposed to steel, and therefore the components will be rusting. So he had everything right, and he succeeded very well too. The notion was that can I make the automobile affordable for my employees, not just for wealthy people. Democratization of innovation, as we talked about. So scale becomes the key advantage in the case of industrial age, whereas in fact in the case of agriculture age, resources becomes your key advantage. Now we come to the digital age. In the digital age, I have found that total cost equals only fixed cost. 
the variable cost is so small. For example, if I want to build a new semiconductor chip or a wafer factory as they call it, my initial cost probably is about two and a half billion dollars. Whereas we thought cost of a paper mill of about six hundred million dollars would be significant fixed cost or a capital cost. This industry has even higher levels of minimal investment to succeed and survive. Same thing when I want to create a major software operating system such as for example Microsoft. Microsoft uh, uh, NT which is a very earlier platform cost probably more than 600 million dollars and today any new software may be billion dollars. So the cost of my first chip is billion dollar. Cost of my first software is billion dollar. Yes, I can have a customer who can buy at that price, that will be only the military government. But my cost of making a second copy of the same semiconductor chip or the software is practically zero. Which means my marginal cost is zero, close to zero, therefore my marginal price must be zero, which means should I give it away free. Now we see the industrial age economics breaking down completely. Because the theory of giving away it free is just not built into the industrial age. So you cannot maximize profits. And answer is yes, you should give it away free. So if you look at the success of Hotmail, giving out free emails, Google, where you have a whole search engine given to you free, you are not paying anything. Or Facebook now, for example, it's all gathering the scale with a very quick speed at the same time. So while industrial age has a scale advantage, agriculture age has the resource advantage, in the digital age you must have scale with speed or scale on steroids as I call it advantage. So you need scale and speed not just scale. And unfortunately in economics while we have the economies of scale theories and economies of scope theories, we don't have theories of economies of speed. We still have not understood. While some companies have used this concept, such as the Japanese automobile makers like Toyota, in what they call lean operations, where you have just-in-time suppliers, you have not only TQM, you have mass customization, but most important element now is cycle time. So, what comes in the way from speeding up the process? Two things in industrial age which were very necessary and right in terms of proprietary standards and vertical integration now become major speed bumps. Because if you want to invent, design, make, sell, service, it takes a long time before you see the revenue coming in. You have to invest a lot more upfront. On the other hand, if you break up the vertical integration, you can move much faster to the market by third party distribution, by partnering, by licensing, however you do it. And the same thing is true very much about proprietary standards. Proprietary standards will limit the market by definition because you put restrictions by price, by agreement and the conditions, etc whereas open standards becomes a much faster platform and we have seen therefore Linux coming as an open standard there are a bunch of open standards have come in all of the academic publishing is all going on to open access press or very much you put your article online pretty much it is reviewed online and it is published almost instantly speed matters so my publication which used to take in the old industrial age maybe for one and a half to two years to publish the paper, I can publish the papers now in a days, if not weeks, for example. So proprietary standards and vertical integration, which are the foundations of industrial age, now become uh, prob problems or liabilities. That's the key point I wanted to make. So what are its implications now? How can we speed up on our scale? 
So I have identified eight different ways a company or an industry can speed up to gain a scale advantage. Uh, the first, as we talked about, is make free to the users. Just make it free. So price as an entry barrier just doesn't come in. Which is why the cell phones in America have been bundled into the services because you make a great, great device, more than million lines of core burnt into that, uh, you know, uh, midware essentially kind of a thing. We are talking about embedded software. Uh, it's just incredibly powerful device and a Motorola as device you input into the automobile used to be $3,000. Think about that. Only about 25 years ago. And today I can get a smartphone for under $200 if I also sign up a service contract, for example. Moving very rapidly, very affordable. So free to the end users. And here are the examples, of course. Hotmail, Google, Yahoo, Facebook. We already talked about that one. Second way is to make IT or this industry digital technologies as utility, like the telephone, cable, and the electricity and gas, where you simply buy as you use it monthly, and you can get out anytime. So you convert for the customer in the market what is a fixed cost into a variable cost. Software as a service is a very key thing. People have done that thing. And remarkably, right now, you see the popularity of cloud computing. Remember, cloud computing is not as secure. It is first generation of understanding how to put all your life into a cloud, essentially. Security issues are enormous. Reliability issues are great. Will it work? It won't work. I mean, I remember all the same debates about cell phones. The networks were so crummy, the billing was not right, but we got used to it because of the convenience of cell phones. And today, cell phones are pretty reliable, relatively speaking, especially if they are digital cell phone or networks as GSM is worldwide, for example. So second major recommendation is to make IT, digital age, industry, product, technologies more as utility, uh, pay as you drink, as we have said primarily, or pay-per-view that you have seen, for example, onto the cable television, monthly fee or something like that, which makes it very affordable. The third recommendation is licensing. Licensing is the fastest way to reach as big a market on a global basis as possible, as opposed to your starting your own factories into different countries which has all of the regulatory, environmental, and uh, uh, human resource issues. So Apple has a license to remember lots of its technologies to others. Apple licenses to every network operator iPhone technology, for example. Lot of uh, licensing is given. SAP now has actually licensed, trained SAP operators or people who can install the SAP installation. So they also have learned how to license it rather than doing it themselves. Android, of course, is becoming a de facto standard in the mobile telephone space, probably knocking off the old proprietary standard like Symbian, which was Nokia-based primarily. And of course, Oracle is another one in terms of large enterprise markets where again, Oracle will license people and install Oracle software, which are, as I mentioned, a lot of Indian IT services do enterprise application uh, uh, planning, primarily EAP uh, software installations, right? Next recommendation is uh, create global IPR enforcement. When you license it, you must make sure that the licensee obliges. In the digital technology world, this is a major debate and a concern. We worry about licensing our technology to emerging economies, especially China. But licensing is the same as franchising. A franchisor like McDonald's, or a franchisor like, for example, Domino Pizza, or any franchisor, hotels are all franchise operations where they do license franchisees. And by the way, many of those franchisees really do not have kind of the professionalism that one would expect. 
even within a country. But the contract laws, or what's called the tort laws, are more enforced worldwide than intellectual property rights, where there are always debates. And therefore you go to litigation. Contract laws are very enforceable. So I become more fond of shifting from the traditional patents, trademarks, etc. as enforcement and more toward contractual way of enforcing a relationship between you and whoever is a licensee. And so Microsoft makes enormous money by licensing its, its uh, architecture to everybody. IBM, even though it exited the PC business, today still makes millions if not billions of dollars in royalty because of the software platform that is built into. While they gave away ThinkPad to Lenovo, a Chinese company, they make money on that surprisingly by exiting a product business. You don't have to manufacture the product to make money like the Texas Instruments thing that I talked about earlier. And Google does the same thing. And Google again makes a lot of money through royalty essentially. So, But you must have enforcement is a very key strategy that you must have therefore a strong legal department, not just strong technology department. Next area is create what we call virtual integration. Vertical integration becomes virtual integration. Uh, the new buzzword is called ecosystem. And one of the pioneers about doing this where I don't have to make everything physically, but I can have suppliers in a network come together was Cisco systems. When they made their routers and the servers, they did the same thing. So unlike IBM, and unlike Sun Microsystems and other server companies, Cisco Systems got a huge advantage like the Henry Ford Model T. Suppliers now commit their resources. They take all of the headaches of making things. Your job is to coordinate primarily and put it together, just like a movie producer does. Everybody is a freelance otherwise, and you strictly have a contractual agreement, and that's it. You don't have long-term commitments. In that case, it's a project by project. And by the way, the best companies that really create uh, virtual integration are the defense contractors. You become a prime contractor and you hire your competitors as your subcontractors because each one has a skill set that nobody can have together. It's too expensive to have that skill set. And as I said, Apple has done the same thing today. As you probably know, most of the Apple is made actually in Asia. Both Taiwanese and the Chinese and Samsung is one of the component suppliers for some of the chips and surprisingly Samsung is their competitor at the same time. So in virtual integration, you blur the boundaries of competitors, suppliers, partners and customers. If you can understand how to do it, you can create a great ecosystem or what is called as virtual integration. The next one is my favorite, which is create a de facto standard. In other words, if there is only one standard, the economies of scale with speed happens much sooner than if you have multiple standards. And I learned it by analyzing the television industry in America. America is the inventor of television as we know today. Commercialized it very successfully. Had companies like Zenith, you might remember, General Electric and RCA. But each one of them was into the analog world of making vacuum tubes based television. You might remember before the flat screen you had these huge television devices. And each manufacturer of each vacuum tube, including a picture tube, was dedicated to your chassis and therefore in the supply chain upstreaming vertical area, there are no economies of scale. So if I'm a Zenith assembler, Zenith brand name, then my suppliers are dedicated to making things only that fit into Zenith. There are no economies of scale. Same thing, RCA suppliers have the same. They're called OEM suppliers, essentially. And now that paradigm comes to haunt you. So what you have to create is one single standard. And that is GSM, as we talked about in the cell phone. 
And today, out of the 5 billion mobile phones, maybe 4 billion are GSM. And the rest of the world has moved on. So what happened to television where all American companies died with the creation of solid-state technology, which Japanese did? As it is happening with HDTV, now it's the same thing, same problem. You have a de facto standard. It can be created by a government or it can be created by market where everybody cooperates. And you have seen already, in fact, uh, the race between Blu-ray and another standard basically is won by one of those guys. And everybody is now aligning with a common standard to get speed going as much as scale going by and large. So HDTV, quartz in watches is the same phenomenon. Learn to create a de facto standard. Next area is that if you are going to have any operations such as manufacturing, it must be flexible, which means it can produce mass customization way economies of making one unit a small lot as economies of making lots of units. In pharmaceutical industry, this is the biggest struggle because at the clinical trial level, you need a factory that can make only small quantity of drugs. Requires a very different equipment, a different process even, as opposed to making large scale bulk drugs such as ibuprofen, which then goes into formulations, into tabulations, into prescription drugs, wherever it goes, downstreaming activities. So you have to create, so the fundamental motion is that if you are going to be wanting speed as your key advantage with the scale, make sure your operations are flexible which means lean operations, which is what Toyota basically evangelized in a very good way, which is cycle time, total customer satisfaction or TQM, and of course, just in time supply function. You also must make sure that you have a very strong understanding of the supply chain or what is called the ecosystem. And you are primarily operating 24-7, 365, there is no rest whatsoever. There are no vacations. Work goes on even the workers are on vacation. How do you do that thing? On a global basis, which says that basically the next point is that you must therefore create global R&D centers. In other words, a design of a new technology, a new innovation cannot stop. Just because one laboratory in one country has come to the night time. So how can you shift the work from one location to the other 24-7, 365 is a very key skill set. And the only way you can do it is to create global R&D centers. As we have seen in software development, everybody does it now. As we have seen in the new Boeing 787 Dreamliner aircraft, which is radically different. I don't know, maybe 10, 11,000 suppliers must have come together. And to manage that requires say, an IT platform, but it's very key that if you are wanting uh, speed with your volume, this is one way to achieve the speed element. And we have seen this basically now in digital media. Today, I know that one of the series that I have created in the academic world called Legends in Marketing, it's, everything is online done between Indian uh, people doing a lot of work real time and the American people here because once you do page proof setting etc in the digital uh, way of printing some things it is already done uh, night time over there is daytime here so you basically have a 24 hour cycle and you speed up the whole process. This is now common across all things digital by and large. So let's conclude this lecture. Economics of digital age are radically different from the industrial age. Fundamental message. In the agriculture age, you maximize resources, such as land and people. In the industrial age, you maximize profits. In the digital age, you can only maximize cash flow. I want to make this as a key point because ultimately, Analysts in the stock market still look at earnings, which is the profit measure, or EBITDA, which is another profit measure. What matters, however, is that are you getting more and more cash accumulated in the company, which usually they look down because the more cash you have, less growth you are. 
And if you don't have a growth above the market rate or economic, uh, economic growth, then the analyst punish you for your stock price. This is just the opposite. It says that in the digital age, what matters is cash. And the best company which is accumulating more cash in such a short time is Google. Apple now has even as much cash flow as Google. And Apple probably will increase its cash flow. Similarly, Microsoft, huge cash flow. Now, with that cash flow, I can do something dramatically different. So, in the digital age, cash flow becomes the measure more so than actually the growth and profitability. Radical shift in the way we look at the price earnings ratio of companies. So, traditional S&P 500 or Dow Jones, which is all measured on uh, earnings per share now changes to cash flow per share very important measure and changes the way you look at the world so companies with industrial age technology and culture are therefore at a significant disadvantage as opposed to companies that only began in the digital age and while we have talked about the uh, you know the googles of the world and the microsoft of the world but real place where i see the difference around here is very young companies trying strictly in the digital age and coming out with applications after applications on an existing platform and especially with the internet and the web-based technology it is much faster they can do it so that's clearly so industrial age companies will have a significant disadvantage the key competitive advantage in the digital age is therefore volume with speed that's the key one not just volume it's volume times speed it's not volume or speed. In the mundane industries, I always talk about this one, that United States Postal Service has the volume but no speed. FedEx, on the other hand, has the speed but no volume. What you need is both. So in the retailing, Walmart has both speed and volume. Sears has maybe no speed at all, some volume, because in order to create the speed, you have to computerize everything, end to end. It's all online, essentially, where the speed comes, which was the advantage of Cisco systems against their competitors who were incumbent industrial companies, such as, for example, IBM in the server business, as we talked about, and other names, HP, another name, same way. So there are eight ways to speed up the volume give it away free, make technology as a utility, which means operating cost only, like cloud computing, licensing, global IPR enforcement, create a virtual integration from vertical integration, which means more partnership suppliers agreements as opposed to ownership, create de facto standards, however you do it, have flexibility in your operations, whether those are manufacturing or service operations, and create global R&D centers. So this is the lecture on economics of the digital age, speed, volume with speed is the right way of phrasing it. Thank you very much. <music>